Hello, and thank you for listening to the History of World War II podcast. Episode 338, The Siege of Malta, begins. Last time, the Germans had entered the area that was for the War of the Mediterranean. Right away, they, rightly so, targeted Admiral Cunningham's carrier, Illustrious. To remove it and the second carrier, Eagle, would be to deny Admiral Cunningham his most powerful offensive weapon. Thus began the Illustrious Blitz. But it wasn't over just yet. January 16, 1941, saw an intense attack against the Illustrious, now birthed in French Creek of the Grand Harbor. The Germans and Italians, with the escorted Stuka dive bombers, came in several times that day, yet the buildings and civilians around the carrier suffered more than the ship. As it was still operational, the attackers would return. When the smoke cleared on January 16th, the apartments and businesses around French Creek were leveled, with many dead family goats lying around, as it was customary to have one. Their owners had to be nearby, but were now underneath tons of sandstone in ugly piles all around. As people came out of their shelters to begin looking for survivors, other Maltese stood nearby to sing a dirge. Their collective hope for finding more survivors was fading fast with the dying sun. Two days later, a Saturday, January 18th, the Germans were back. But working out what had went wrong in their attack on the 16th, they pinpointed two issues. First, the buildings around Illustrious were acting as a shield, though less so now, as they had been pulverized. But secondly, the fighters that rose from the island caused the attackers losses they did not have to suffer, should those planes be eliminated or never allowed to take off. So the 18th saw the airfields at Lucca and how far get that day's attention. Should the structure services that kept those planes operational and or their runways be unusable, the pilots and their fighters would be grounded, which meant the illustrious could be attacked again, but in a more relaxed, methodical way. It was a solid plan. But as the Germans and Italians bombed how far in the southeast corner of Malta and Lucca, about four miles to the northwest of how far, by now most of the fighters were based at Takali, roughly in the center of the island. Thus they were able to take off once the invaders were spotted. One of these pilots, George Burgess, would lift off four times that day. On the plus side, he was able to gain altitude with the attackers striking somewhere else, and he would end the day with one kill and two other Stukas damaged. However, as the AA crews on the ground were, how shall we say, enthused about also protecting the island, they weren't always keen to stop firing whenever a defending hurricane flew in close to attack a Stuka. Burgess's plane suffered a few holes that might not have come from enemy aircraft. Still, the damage to the airfields was repairable, and Burgess survived the day. The next day, Sunday, January 19th, both sides were at it again, with the Stukas going back to the illustrious, thinking they had crippled the two airfields, not realizing yet the hurricanes were based somewhere else. As George Burgess was a part of the 8 a.m. to noon shift, by 10 a.m. he had downed two more Stukas. In an ironic twist, the Hurricanes outclassed the Stukas, as earlier the Italian fighters had outperformed the antiquated gladiators. Then again, the Stukas had been hoping that the previous day's raid would have seen a reduction in the Hurricanes taking to the skies. That had not happened, thus a few more dive bombers slammed into the island's soil, or the nearby waters. By 11 a.m., Burgess was taking off for the third time that morning, but in his second hurricane. With so much use and abuse, the planes were barely holding together, as were some of the pilots. The best that could be done for the humans were the four-hour shifts, so they could hopefully stay caught up on their rest. But until a certain point is reached, and for each person that's different, adrenaline and fear helped them push past 
the fatigue. Burgess climbed through the skies in his hurricane and this time spotted Ju-88 twin-engine bombers. The Germans had wisely pulled back their vulnerable Stukas. And right on cue, the AA guns below began to bellow. The black puffs following the bombers went heading towards the illustrious, and not wanting to put himself unnecessarily in harm's way, Burgess went to the back side of the Junkers formation. Picking the last bomber of this formation so the other planes could not come to its aid, Burgess closed in and opened up, but so did the bomber's tail gunner. As bullets were passing by each other, heading in the opposite direction, Burgess felt something slam into his shoulder. But as he did not feel anything beyond that, he kept firing a long burst into the bomber. Eventually, the plane's port engine began to smoke and flame. Burgess pulled away. Not until he was on the ground did he realize that one of the tail gunner's bullets had hit him in his shoulder, which should have made his arm useless. However, it hit the thick metal buckle of his parachute, leaving him mostly unharmed. However Burgess processed the fact that he had almost died, it would not keep him from going up the next time he was needed to. As for the bombs that were dropped near the illustrious, the vast majority of them missed, again, due to the raised dust and smoke. But those near misses further damaged the surrounding buildings of the three cities, most certainly Sanglia. After that last raid on that Sunday, people from all walks of life came out to help clear the rubble and search for survivors, including the Royal West Kents. They set up their headquarters at the Sanglia police station and got busy removing debris and bodies, while always listening for screams of help. It was understood by all that the Germans could come back at any time. So, like Burgess, everyone did what they could, while they could. There was nothing else for it. And yet, maybe it was the overall number of lost bombers during those mid-January days, but the 19th was the last raid for a while, which allowed all hands to make the illustrious seaworthy. So, on January 23rd, she set sail for Alexandria for more detailed repairs. Two days later, she reached her destination to the great relief of Admiral Cunningham. Alas, it would be impossible to fully repair the carrier, certainly not while being so close to a war zone. So, after an assessment at Durban, South Africa, it was determined to send her onto the Norfolk Naval Yard along the American East Coast, for permanent repairs. Only in hindsight would the people of Malta realize that the illustrious Blitz had been the beginning of the siege of Malta. Further, measuring their defensive capability against what the Italians had previously thrown at them, compared to what the Germans had done in three days' worth of attacks, all on the islands realized they were not prepared or ready for such a sustained attack. Malta's darkest days were still ahead. Here's a question for you. What would you do to save humanity? And how far would you go to stop someone who is getting in your way? The ancient rivalry of assassins and Templars cuts to the heart of good versus evil. But it wasn't always clear who was good and who was evil. Plug in to explore the amazing world of medieval feuds. Echoes of History. Assassins vs. Templars is a special collaboration between History Hit and Ubisoft, the masterminds behind the Assassin's Creed games. Hosted by Dan Snow from History Hit and Matt Lewis from Gone Medieval, together they will take a close look at the real history of the secret societies, which inspired the Assassin's Brotherhood and the Templar Order in the Assassin's Creed games. Plus, they will bring on other premier historians as they discuss unearthing the myths of the Grail and who really was the inspiration for the main characters in the game. Echoes of History, Assassins vs. Templars podcast is available right now wherever you get your podcasts. Listen and subscribe to Echoes of History today to discover the hidden truths that have shaped our world and inspired the video game series. That's Echoes of History wherever you get your podcasts. Listen today and subscribe for more. 
taking a break from the threat from the air, Admiral Cunningham was hoping to dispense his own justice below the waves. As we have seen, Commander of Submarines George Shrimp Simpson was put in charge of the submarine base on Manoel Island within the Marzamzet Harbor, opposite the Grand Harbor where the Illustrious had been based. That is, after it was up and running. Shrimp was 39, so too old to head out himself, not that he did not want to. His experience would have been invaluable, but this was a younger man's war, and they needed to gather their own experience. No, Shrimp knew it was best for him to stay behind and get the base up and running. One, to take care of the multiple crews, and two, to help Cunningham deliver their own attacks against the enemy's Mediterranean vessels. As Admiral Cunningham's plate was currently full to overflowing, he told Shrimp everything at the base was up to him. Now the commander's plate was full, but he leaned into it with a will. Right off the bat, anticipating his needs, he requested several engineers that he had worked with to be sent to Malta. They might have been upset by this, but their respect for Shrimp, along with the obvious needs of the Mediterranean subs, removed any grumbling. But having personnel with the right skill is only step one. Equipment and tools of all kinds were needed, which put them in the same position as the RAF mechanics who had already learned the constant order of the day make do. So, in the long-established tradition of young Spartan males who, as a part of their training, were practically kicked out and told to fend for themselves, which also meant meals, the engineers would drive around the island, mostly along the dock areas, and upon seeing something that could help their cause, well, it somehow found its way into the back of their truck, mostly at night. Thus, the repair facilities were coming along quite nicely. With Shrimp looking at the larger picture, Lieutenant Commander Malcolm D. Wanklin of the Upholder and his second-in-command, 23-year-old Michael Tubby Crawford, focused on their sub to get ready for their first outing. The German attacks on the Illustrious during her time in the Grand Harbor had shaken Shrimp, Wakelin, and Tubby, though the latter, with two junior ratings personnel, had spent their time operating their twin Lewis machine guns, trying to knock out the dive bombers. So, just like the Maltese and the British, they were forced to up their collective game in defending Malta and taking the fight to the enemy. Still, Shrimp knew what was coming. His boats would be sent out. Submariners call their subs boats, not ships. Some would return, and some not. And along the way, men would die. And as Malta offered little distraction, as many of the natives had re-departed the shoreline, he struck upon an idea of how to help his men's mental stress. Shrimp knew he, or Malta, could offer few entertainments, but he could create the second best option, distraction. Telling his men to help secure their food needs, he told the crews that their island, Manuel, would retain and care for pigs. Most of these young men had no such experience at this, so its novelty would force them to focus on the swine and not lost friends. Pop Giddings was sent to make the purchase, and thus the submariner's pig farm was established to go along with the beginning of the Siege of Malta. The sub-upholder, with Lieutenant Commander Wanklin in command, backed by Tubby Crawford and the crew, left the harbor on January 24th. True, the upholder had come from London, but its crew was still learning how she behaved, which was vital when stressful moments came. Thus far, that knowledge could be summed up with the sub's trim, or balance, that is, how steady she carried herself, was very sensitive. Not exactly what one wants in a warboat. Next, being a bit smaller than other subs, her power source left a lot to be desired. When on the surface, she could engage her diesel engine and thus charge her battery. Now, this battery could last for 60 hours, if she was going very slow, but that time would be greatly reduced if she was doing her max of eight knots. 
and considering her lack of speed, the upholder was not going to be running down anything. If she was going to launch an attack, it would have to be because she was already ahead of her target. But that came down to intelligence, and since the Italians had recently changed their codes, there was little enough of that. That is, until the government code in cipher school at Blenchley Park broke the new codes. So, it came back down to air reconnaissance, and that came back to controlling the skies over the Mediterranean, which was one reason why the Germans were trying to destroy the illustrious. A nice, complete circle of death or victory. Thus, the upholder sailed on with her crew, with her eight torpedoes, and wishes for success from Churchill on down. The idea was to disrupt, if not stop outright, the traffic of goods and troops from Italy to North Africa. Currently, the upholder patrolled the area to the northwest of Tripoli. Going back and forth near there gave them a good chance of running across something, and that's what happened at 1.30 a.m. on January 26th. Spotting three supply ships, protected by an Italian destroyer, Wanklin tried to get into an effective range, given the limitations of his U-class submarine, and as well as Shrimp telling his captains not to shoot unless they were 2,000 yards or closer. Currently, the upholder was 2,500 yards away. But should Wanklin waste this opportunity, wasn't it his discretion as the captain? Would 500 yards really make all that much of a difference? Wanklin decided it would not. Working hard to keep his 2,500 yards, he ordered two torpedoes fired after a lengthy process of judging distance, speed, and other factors. But Wanklin had overestimated the convoy's speed, thus his fish went harmlessly by. The good news was that his attack went unnoticed, leaving him free to try again. Wanklin ordered a few alterations and fired off two more torpedoes. Now there was nothing to do but wait and see if his gamble paid off. It did not. The silence went on, as did the convoy. By the time two more torpedoes were ready to go, the Italians were gone. Wanklin had just gained some of that experience that Shrimp needed him to, but at least no one of the crew had died. Two nights later, another Italian merchant ship was come upon. This time, luck was on a side as Wanglin got into within 900 yards. Firing two of his last four torpedoes, it was back to the waiting game to see if a detonation followed. Sure enough, an explosion was heard, but per the standing orders, the upholder did not wait around to gauge the damage, for surely there would be a response from the enemy. And as the sub was meant to hit and run, it was time for the latter. With only two torpedoes left, Lieutenant Commander Wanklin must have experienced mixed emotions when he came upon two larger-than-average merchant ships on January 30th, escorted by at least two destroyers. Had he not wasted his third and fourth torpedoes on his first attack, he might have been able to give all before him holy hell. As it was, he would focus on the merchant ships. But due to various reasons, the speed of the targets, not to mention the destroyers, the upholder could not get closer than 4,000 yards. This was the night of the first attack all over again, but the targets were too tempting. Plotting the torpedo's course, Wanklin ordered, fired, and then ordered the sub to dive. No matter what happened in the next minute or two, those destroyers would soon be all over them. And, being out of fish, it was time to go home. Miraculously, as the upholder dove at increased speed, an explosion was heard. Something had been hit. The crew cheered and then got quiet as the ASDIC, or detection device, told them that the destroyers were coming in and dropping death charges. Staying quiet and keeping their heading straight, the Italians could not pinpoint the sub, as they did not have detection devices for another month or two, given to them by the Germans. Thus, the crew's escape was made, 
and they arrived at Malta on February 1st. All torpedoes had been used with two hits and no one injured or worse. It could have been much worse. And in one way, it was worse. The upholder returned to another German air attack from the air, not the surface of the waves. And when the crew emerged from the upholder and looked around, they saw that the peninsula that held the capital, Valletta, was empty, except for military and rescue personnel. The sub-crew was about to find out that the raids were occurring practically every day, that the three cities, again, on the east side of the Grand Harbor, were empty, due to, this time, an order from Governor Dobby. The one advantage of this besides unnecessary deaths, was that there was more room in the various underground shelters. Still, they were far from having creature comforts, certainly those not brought by the individuals themselves. But, being so deep down, the people there, from the dock workers to the military intelligence staff, were safe from access bombs. Clearly, the fight needed to be taken to the enemy to the north. Otherwise, the rise in attacks would continue. It was decided in London to weaken the Italians' resolve that was, in part, housing and supplying those Germans now based on Sicily. Which brings back into the story Adrian Warby Warburton, who only seemed to be put on this planet to fly planes and take pictures. Mind you, minus the taking off and landing. In early February, Flight Commander Whiteley was ordered by London, no less, for some pictures of specific locations. This was not normally the kind of place that reconnaissance was gathered on, but London wanted it, so Warby was called in, Whiteley's number one guy for such assignments. Indeed, Warby's life and the lives of his fellow pilots were changing rapidly. First, 431 Flight was promoted to 6-9 Squadron, as more pilots and planes were coming in. Yet, some things just don't change. Just before the British air raid on Taranto, Warby had been ordered up one last time for photos. He fulfilled his mission, but during his takeoff, he went right over several flares that had been lit up to help him take off. They didn't make much difference, and some of them got caught on his rudder taking a trip with him, making it easier for the enemy to spot him. Still, Warby somehow made it home safely. On Christmas Eve, Warby was sent up again, provided the plane survived the takeoff, to head over Sicily to take pictures of a growing presence of Germans. As they were still gearing up, a three-engine Italian bomber rose up to take Warby out. Much like his takeoffs, No one could say for sure how he did it, but it was the Italian plane that splashed down, and Warby made it home with his updated photos. Soon after this, Warby was promoted from pilot officer to flying officer, which went nicely with his distinguished flying cross for his pre-Taranto work. He also stumbled into a blossoming relationship with a Christina Ratcliffe, She was stranded on Malta when the war broke out, but kept herself busy by starting a dance performance show to entertain the troops. Soon after, she became a plotter for the RAF, but later was promoted from there. Another life that changed at this time was that of George Burgess. It may be remembered that he was only a part-time fighter pilot, that his full-time job was as aide-de-camp to Air Commodore Maynard, but he asked permission to be dismissed from that so he could serve full-time as a pilot to the newly formed 69 Squadron. Back to the plan created by London that would hopefully see the Italians demoralized and distracted enough to lose enthusiasm for supporting the Germans, after the German airborne attack on Fort Eben Amal in Belgium in May of 1940, Churchill ordered the creation of his own airborne formation. One can hate their enemies, but it's always wise to acknowledge a brilliant tactic. But due to several logistical issues, the first unit was actually retrained commando troops. Of the 350 men of No. 11 Special Air Service Battalion, 38 members were separated to form X Troop 
and it would be they who would launch an attack on the Italian mainland. The idea was to destroy a freshwater aqueduct close to Calitri in southern Italy. If this source of fresh water could be taken out, not only would many Italian civilians be without fresh water, but so too would be several ports used by the Italian Navy. As these ports were servicing war efforts in North Africa and Albania, this one operation, called Operation Colossus, might have far-reaching effects. After six weeks of intensive training, as well as bringing on Italian interpreters, X-Troop was flown to Malta on February 7th. Warby brought back photos that actually showed two aqueducts, but it was decided to go after the larger of the two. At 6.30 p.m. on February 10th, the six twin-engine Whitley bombers left Malta, having no contact with the enemy during the flight. Not that it mattered, as the operation started falling apart from there. The men from the first five planes successfully parachuted near their target location. However, two of those planes did not send out their equipment due to the icing up of the release mechanisms. Yet the last plane dropped their men and equipment two hours later and two miles away, and this plane was carrying the sappers, those who were to set up the chargers, as well as most of the explosives. This left the men and remaining equipment, once they all assembled, to proceed on as best they could. Then came the next issue. The base of the supporting structure was found to be made of reinforced concrete, not bricks. Thus, what explosives they had would not be enough. Still, it was worth a try. At 30 minutes past midnight on February 11th, the explosives were set off, which caused the aqueduct to break in half, but remaining upright. With the job done, supposedly, the men broke into three groups and set out for the coast to be picked up by one of Commander Shrimp's submarines. But due to the explosion and the reporting of some locals, all the commandos were captured by morning. The soldiers were sent to a POW camp. The Italian translator was executed for treason. Yet even if the commandos had made it to the pickup point, their sub, the HMS Triumph, would not have been there. During this raid, Two bombers had been sent out from Malta on a diversionary bomb run, but one plane had engine trouble and radioed back to Malta that it was going down, which just happened to be near the pickup point. Shrimp guessed that the Italians had probably heard this radio message and they would send ships and thus find his sub. As he needed every boat he had, he ordered the Triumph to turn around and head back to Malta. The operation was a disaster from start to finish, and the worst part was, it was all for nothing. The aqueduct was barely damaged and fixed well before the local reservoirs ran dry. The Italian people did not suffer and then began to hate the Germans. Well, that would come soon enough regardless. Either way, the raids over Malta only increased. During January, the air raid sirens had gone off 50 times. By the end of the second week of February, that number had doubled. Life on Malta had come to a standstill. The people below simply tried to survive each raid and then search out and bury those that had not. It wasn't living, but it was better than dying. It wasn't much better for the submariners of Malta as they defined their current lives by the sinking of ships of their enemies, their lives, too, had all but come to a stop. In fact, the Upholder, having its two hits from its eight torpedoes on its last mission, was the only boat to have any success thus far. And when she went out again on February 12th, the crew found something worse than death. During the night, the Upholder spotted the silhouette of another sub, just 25 miles south of Malta. Lieutenant Commander Wanklin was awakened and peered at the other sub through the periscope. He ordered that a radio challenge be sent to that sub. 
second-in-command Tubby Crawford, who was actually quite skinny, asked, Was that wise? Winklin responded that, to him, it looked like a T-class sub, one of their own. Tubby parried with, then why is it not responding to our challenge? Winklin ordered another challenge. There was only silence. Winklin, being prudent, ordered his crew ready to fire. A third challenge was sent out. More silence. Now Tubby began to waver. The two started talking about how they would feel if they fired and found out it was one of their own. Both men agreed that it would be a disaster. Better to risk their sub and their crew to getting closer rather than just accidentally kill their own countrymen. The upholder moved in closer, but was still ready to fire. In the end, it turned out to be the HMS Truant, truly one of theirs. Thus, lives were saved that night, by men who were not afraid to risk their lives and the lives of their crew in order not to be guilty of the unforgivable. And yet, as success builds on itself, so does failure, and the British and Commonwealth troops were about to experience this firsthand. The U-class subs were still being figured out by the crews, which is natural enough, but the various restrictions placed on the submarines greatly reduced their effectiveness in this phase of the war. First was the U-class's ability to only carry eight torpedoes, but as the crews got better, this disadvantage would dissipate. But that was in the future. Next, the current restriction of firing on merchant ships once they were beyond 35 miles of the enemy's coastline made life far more dangerous for the sub-crews, To operate that close was to put oneself in range of an enemy's land-based guns and mines. As to why this restriction was still around, who can definitively say? But it was removed on February 22nd, which didn't matter all that much. For by then, the war in North Africa, certainly going the Allies' way, what with the whole of Cyrenaica, as well as Tobruk, Gazala, Derna, and Benghazi in British hands, was about to be lost. All of it. Before the 35-mile restriction was lifted, the Germans had been able to send over massive amounts of men and equipment to Tripoli. And on February 14th, Major General Erwin Rommel arrived in North Africa to take command. Greetings from Central Virginia. So um, I just wanted to say hi. I'll get to the members and donations next time. Um, Today's a little rushed, as it is my birthday. There are tens of thousands of you, and I've gotten like six messages. So shame, shame on the rest of you. No, I'm just joking. Anyway, hope you all have a great day, and I will um, edit this and get it out as fast as I can in between the birthday cake and ice cream and whatever else, what other other debauchery happens. And uh, we'll see you as soon as we can with the next episode. Take care, everyone. Power Penny days are back with hundreds of deals under $15 at JCPenney. Check out cool closet basics like everyday family tees, just $9 for women and $7 for kids. And sweet home essentials like $5 quick dry home expressions bath towels. Or grab a coupon on the JCPenney app to get an extra 25% store wide. Great prices, easy savings. JCPenney. Offers and coupon valid on select styles through 423. Power Penny deals excluded from coupon. Other exclusions apply. See store or jcp.com for details.